All right, we are going to kick this party off. This is Say Yes to NoSQL. And I say for .NET SQL developers, but what I'm going to cover will really apply to any developer. I'm using a lot of .NET examples. I do want to note that we're coming here live from TechBash in Pocono Manor. And a bunch of excited, rowdy developers are in the house, right? All right. Worked out well. Um, almost like we planned it. I'll do a really brief introduction. We only have an hour, so I've cut this to half the time. My name is Jeremy Lickness. I am a cloud developer advocate. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means in a second. I work for Microsoft, and I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, I started to put 25 years, and then I realized it's really a quarter century, so why not put that on the deck? And I, I joke because I've spent half my career on the product side, half of my career on the consulting side, and now I'm starting the other half of my career in the developer relations side. I never was good with math. You can contact me through those links. My blog covers cloud developer topics. My Twitter is open, so you can reach out to me that way. And I accept all of your Microsoft incoming mail. The Cloud Developer Advocate team is a global team. We're all around the world. We have individuals who specialize in different areas from Linux to containers, front-end development, machine learning, .NET. You can use that first link, the Advocates link, to find out who we are, where we're at, what we cover. And I like to tell people we fo focus on what I call the three Cs. The first C is community. That's meeting developers where they're at, whether it's online or offline in person. The second C is content. We are very driven to provide the best documentation experience augment that with blog posts, videos, and other content. And the final piece is that we have a connection with engineering. We're an engineering team. We don't report up through marketing and sales. And we advocate in the sense that if you have a problem, it's my job to go back to the team who works on that technology and make sure we address it. So don't hesitate to reach out with your feedback for this. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the legacy of relational databases, the SQL legacy. I'll introduce you to what NoSQL is. I'll give you a ton of examples on our fully managed platform that's called Cosmos DB. We'll include demos. And it's in the cloud, so I like to use live demos so everyone cross their fingers for me. We'll see how the connection holds up. And we'll save some time for some questions and have fun throughout the process. So I know that no one in their career has ever run into this, right, starting a new project. This is how we've always done it. Relational databases have been around a very long time. And I would be oversimplifying it if I said the only reason relational databases existed was to solve the storage problem. But that was a huge driver decades ago when storage was exponentially more expensive. And so the idea was to minimize as much data as possible and have these tight relationships. Now, there's a lot of other advantages, and this is not about non-relational is bad or we're replacing it. This is talking about another approach that you can use to augment your tools. One of the things we run into a lot when we design our applications is this idea that on one side of the spectrum, we have our relational database. And we need experts in creating and managing relational databases, optimizing queries, et cetera. On the other side, we have developers who are using an object-oriented approach or a domain-driven approach, whatever approach. And they're modeling the business with objects. And so this creates a little bit of a disconnect that we try to fix with something called a object relational mapper. And again, not saying object relational mappers are bad. There's some projects that work really well with these, and those will drive the classes, and those will drive the database and do a good job of that. However, you may have possibly been on a project where you had to change a property or add a property, and you had to work through the database team to have that schema applied to the database. Then you had to update your unit tests and refactor your objects and classes to add that property. And then on top of that, you had to go to the ORM and tell it about the change and describe that. And sometimes that extra ceremony might not be necessary. I don't know if any of you have run into this in your database designs. The metadata table, because you're storing a lot of different types of data, so you need sort of an open-ended way so you're not constantly updating schemas. 
maybe you're using built-in XML and JSON or just serializing and stuffing into a field. If you're doing that, you're probably using a relational database in a way that it wasn't intended for. So the idea of NoSQL is not that there's no SQL allowed. It's not only SQL. It's another toolkit to add to your box. There are dozens and dozens of types of non-relational databases. The four most common are listed here, key value, column, document, graph, and we'll tackle those. Key value is really just a dictionary that you persist to disk. It's optimized for the scenario where you know the key and you're looking up the value. I'll give you two examples for that. One would be a user logs into your site and you have user preferences that may change over time, but you have that user's ID, so you want to quickly grab that data and manipulate it. Another example is what's shown here in tiny font as, as possible as I could get for you, but that is a uh, link shortener tool that takes a short code and maps it to a long code. Perfect example of, of using this type of database. A document is just what it says, the set of properties. They don't have to be flat. You can have nested properties. I'm going to show you an example of that. Then we have a graph database. Graph is pretty interesting. It organizes things in what we call nodes or vertices that have information about them. And then we have edges that point between nodes on that graph. And those edges can have information associated with them as well. Two canonical examples of this, one would be a flights database where the nodes are airports, the edges are flight paths, and then the information might be the duration or the length of the flight path, the coordinates of the airport, and so forth. Another example might be modeling a family tree. So you have a node that's an individual and an edge is a relationship. Finally, we have column databases. Columns take data that we might conceptually organize into rows and think of bags of properties with an identifier and they store those as columns and information in columns. And I'm oversimplifying it a bit, but the notion is if I'm searching for values over a column, I have a highly optimized lookup. But even better, if I'm only projecting a few properties off a large complicated document, instead of having to look up all these pages of data and subsetting them, we can project right off the pages of the data in the columns. So it's highly optimized for that scenario. The implementation of NoSQL in Azure is called Cosmos DB, and it's a, a fully managed solution. And I want to just step in and, and kind of jump off talking for a second and go into my first demo. Out of curiosity, who here has created a, a SQL database or any type of relational database? What about a database cluster? All right, for those on the stream, we had about three hands. What about a geo-replicated? SQL cluster. All right, so we have someone there. So I'm going to show that experience in the cloud in just a second. So I'm going into my Azure portal. I'm picking Cosmos DB. This is going to be a wrapper around the databases that I'm going to work with. I pick a subscription so we know where to send the bill. I pick a resource group. I'm giving it a unique, so we can call this Tech Bash. Cosmos, and then I pick an API. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. I'm going to choose the SQL API, which may not be what it, it seems to be at face value. I can pick a location, but here's something interesting. If I pick East US for my location, and then I click Enable Geo Redundancy, I'm automatically going to provision another cluster on the West Coast, and that'll be set up out of the box to have that, that failover. I'll show you how you change that. Now we could go through multiple steps and click create, and then you could wait five minutes and watch a spinner. Sometimes it only takes a couple minutes, but I'm not gonna bore you through that. But those are the steps it takes for me to get one of these up and running and ready to go. And we'll look at a few of those. Now the reason why I might wanna go in and perform that action is many fold. First, every item that I put in my NoSQL database can be independent of other items. I don't have to adhere to a specific schema. Very flexible. That does not mean there's not indexing support, though. In fact, by default, many engines will automatically index all of your indices. And you can configure how that happens, when it happens, to optimize your database. But you completely have indexes. I'm going to show you some demos of what that looks like. 
very easy to manipulate the documents. You make your changes and, and store them back. There's no schema migration. I call it JSON ready. Most of the interfaces by default will return data in a JSON format, so you're not jumping through a lot of transformation hoops to get that data out to the client and ultimately render it in your UI. These are designed to be extremely fast over large volumes of data and handle large data sets. And by large, I mean terabytes up to petabytes in size of, of data. They're what I call version proof. This is taking advantage of the schema. If my user profile suddenly takes on new properties, I can simply start storing those properties. I don't have to go and make updates and changes. I can programmatically choose my defaults from that. And they're ORM free. You can use an ORM with Cosmos DB. Entity Framework just came out with an adapter, but you don't have to. The native drivers, most of the time, will deliver you documents ready for you to work with, which is pretty powerful. Some of the other things you get is turnkey global distribution. What does that mean? I can give rules to partition my data. These are logical containers of related data. And then when I make a change, it's going to automatically replicate that data across the, the globe. And I'll talk a little bit more about partition key management and, and what that means and what that looks like. But this is handled for me. I don't have to explicitly configure sharding. I just tell it this is the property that determines where it's going to be partitioned. And then it fans that out. And again, we'll look at that. I don't have a single machine bottleneck, even if I'm in a single region, I'm provisioning a cluster so I can take advantage of failover. The partition management I talked about is handled for me. I can select my throughput, and I'm going to talk about the unique model that you use for billing for Cosmos DB because it's tied closely to throughput and designed to manage and meet you at where your needs are for throughput. You can do things like set a time to live on a document. There's no more writing jobs periodically purge more records. You can stamp that record and have it auto expire for you. Forget about it, database handles that. And then there's supports for that, that scale of throughput. There's guaranteed low latency, which is always nice, right? We don't like to wait a long time for our databases. And there's five well-defined consistency models. And for the consistency models, I like to jump out and do a little bit of an explanation because I find this is um, confusing in some senses for people who are familiar with the concept. So the idea is that because you have a distributed database, if you're going to have what's called strong consistency, where everyone who writes or reads sees the exact same thing, all that data on a write has to replicate across the globe. And there's latency built into the network, and network paths aren't guaranteed. So this may take a period of time. So that means it's expensive to maintain, and it also means that you're availability is a little bit lower because you have to wait for that data to replicate before it's over. And then I think uh, people are familiar with the other extreme, which is eventual consistency. This is the least expensive, highest availability, highest performance, highest capacity. It basically allows writes to come in in any order. And what that means is if I'm tracking a score for a game, and it was home visitor, home visitor, I may actually get a score that says home two visitor zero because those rights came in out of order because it allows it to propagate through the system sort of on its own and eventually become consistent. You may ask, well, why on earth would I use it? There's a lot of use cases. For example, I may have a review site where I have thousands of customers simultaneously submitting reviews. And it's OK if they don't all pop up in real time. They can eventually settle into their, their values. I may have sensor devices that I'm aggregating data, and that data will converge on a trend that I'm looking at, even if the individual specifics of a device's time sequence is a little bit out of order. What Cosmos DB does a little bit uniquely is it allows me to dial in these middle consistency levels. The bounded staleness says I'm going to allow for a lag between everything synchronizing. So in other words, I'll write out to my database, but there may be a delay when someone reads, but I can guarantee what that delay is. I can set a time interval, so this is guaranteed to never be more than five minutes stale, or I can set an operations interval, so I can guarantee I'm never more than X operations behind. In most cases, this is acceptable, but it could be a little strange. If I have a social app, maybe I'm storing calorie counts, 
and I update a meal and then I refresh my app, I may not see that meal because my read is lagged behind my write. So to address that scenario, there's this middle consistency level called session consistency. And what session consistency does is it ensures that your session is consistent. What you write is what you get back. And then you have that delay for other sessions. And this is perfect for that app because I will see my consistent calories as I enter meals. My friend who's going to jump on the account and like that, oh, look, you had pizza or whatever, they may not see it for a few minutes or seconds or whatever that delay is. And you have metrics to know what those delays are averaging out to be. And then finally, we have consistent prefix. Consistent prefix is like bounded staleness, what I said earlier, where you guarantee it's going to be five minutes or 1,000 operations. Consistent prefix says you are going to see records in order, but we're going to bring them in whenever it makes sense. In other words, you're not setting that guarantee. So because you're not setting that guarantee, session, consistent prefix, and eventual consistency have higher availability and throughput and actually cost less to manage than the strong and the bounded staleness consistency levels. And I've got a link where you can jump out and dig into more information because that could be an entire talk in and of itself. Another unique aspect of Cosmos DB is it handles a lot of different interfaces. These interfaces support those four main types of NoSQL database I talked about earlier. Some of these interfaces are proprietary. For example, the SQL API is a document database. It's a database where you can have schema changes between documents, but it allows you to use a SQL syntax to query it. So you can leverage your existing knowledge and skills with SQL to query the database. Some of these APIs have been out for some time. MongoDB has existed for years. And by supporting this interface, what we're allowing is for two things. One is if we have applications written in MongoDB, we can take advantage of hosting them in Cosmos DB because we support the same API. The other thing is if someone has knowledge about that API, they can bring that knowledge to Cosmos DB development. And I'll talk a little more about how that's pulled off in a second. So the first example I want to jump into is a link shortener, and we're going to start with this concept of table storage. So what I've set up is a database in Cosmos DB. It's replicated West Coast, East Coast, and over in Europe. And I did that just by going into a screen and literally just selecting where's my replication, and then it handles that for me. And you can see I have a list of tables. This is important because this will change when we look at some other examples. In those tables, I have this URLs example. And if we look at the individual URLs, you can see I have two items in this table. Or not. No, I have to expand this part. Let's Two documents, that's great. Where are my two documents? All right, so we will jump to another way of looking at this. I'm going to run my local example and use a Storage Explorer. Anyone familiar with Storage Explorer? So a few shows of hands. So this is a tool that allows us to navigate to our accounts locally, and I'll zoom in. So here I've got Cosmos DB accounts. No attached account. Oh, that's my, my local. Let's go to this vanilla. All right, here we go. Here's table storage. And this would show you a similar thing that I'd see in the portal if I had enough display space. These are a bunch of internal logs. I'm going to load more. There we go. So URLs. So if I pull up URLs, and this is actually part of a, a live link shortener I have, you can see I have this hard-coded row key of key. That's how I get my next up code. And then I have these different values that map to the longer URLs. And you can see there's different data in each one, which is interesting to see because in my source code, if we hop over to my short link, I basically use something called a table entity that has those default base values. It knows that there's always going to be a key, for example. So table entity, if you inspect it, has a key value on it. 
I basically in, inherit from that and give it what's unique for me. So I have a next up ID that I want to track. If we look at the data side, I'm tracking a short code that maps to a URL and account. This particular example is written as a, a serverless function. I know there was a, a session earlier today that covered these. So I use bindings to bring in values. This is bringing in that actual key value. And this binding is bringing in something that I can operate with table storage. And what I'm really just interested in showing you is what the operations look like as a .NET developer. So here is what it takes to insert a value into the database. I tell it I'm doing an insert, I wait for it to happen, and I'm done. This is an example of replacing an existing value, so I increment the key and replace it. And this is an example of inserting a new one. So if I run this, what's nice is this, this example I haven't updated, so it's using a storage table emulator, but the APIs are almost identical for the Cosmos DB version. And there's a local Cosmos DB emulator that you can use as well that I'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm up and running, so I've got this host. And if we come back to my storage explorer, I want to show you before I run this how handy the, the storage bindings are in the function. Yep. So if I look at my local storage, and this is what's nice if we have local emulators, it's going to pull these up. You can see right now I don't have any tables defined. I've got some of the internal tables behind the functions, but there's no actual URLs table. If I take the link that was parsed, Right here, I have a set and a go. The set is what picks up a value, so it's going to convert a long URL to a short one, and the go is what does the redirect. I'm going to jump into my browser, paste the set, and I'm going to tell it href equals, let's do twitch.tv slash visual studio, which is where the live stream is, I believe. And you can see immediately I got back this DP value, so that's the, the short code value. I'm going to zoom back out, and then I'm going to change this to go, DP, and then I'm probably going to close this quickly because we'll have sort of inception experience of the live stream being live stream on the live stream of the live stream. So, but you can see we, we yeah, got the redirect and we're good to go. So what I want to show you that happened behind the scenes, to get an idea of this development experience. If I refresh my tables. I now have a URLs table, and I have those two values inside that URLs table. So it's a pretty straightforward experience. I have my own link shortener in production, and all of these examples are open source, so you can work with them. Mine's slightly more complicated in that I'm also using the SQL API for document storage. And what I do is I take metadata about that link click and store it so I can analyze it and stand up analytics. So here you can see some code that's basically pulling off information from the user agent and from the referrer. And I'm basically just interested in, you know, is it a mobile, is it not a mobile browser? Who's the referring URL if that's passed in? And I'm creating a dynamic document and just leaving the function because the binding will automatically insert that document for me. So hopefully, zoomed in at this level, we can come into my data explorer for that database. So this is my live link shortening database. And you can see here, instead of tables, we have collections now. Name something different because we're using a different API. I'm replicating west coast to east coast. I'm going to go into my stats. And let's give us a little more space. We can pick an ID. And we can see here's, here's some simple data. And this was early on when I started it. I didn't track that much data. It was like, hey, we redirected to this page. What I've done, though, is I've enhanced it a little bit. So I'm going to create a new SQL query. And I can use the syntax I'm used to for SQL. I can say select star from C. What I'm going to do is just change this slightly and say select top five star from C, order by C, timestamp descending. To give me the five most recent documents that were inserted. We do that, and let's go full screen. And you know this trick, right? If you get these dots, you just move the 
mouse clockwise. And that speeds it up. That'll bring it. And it's asking me to do the query again because it wants me to really demonstrate how we can use our skills in SQL. From C, order by C, yes, descending. We'll execute that. And now you can see I have recent documents. And these have a little bit more metadata. I didn't have to go and change the schema. Now, just because my schema is not the same doesn't mean I can't do something like this and stand up a set of metrics that are giving me the most clicked links that I have that are breaking down which media outlet is most popular. Is it coming from my blog? The gray here is, is Twitter for that. And then uh, let's get out of this crazy zoom. Now I can look at refers and do some interesting things like look at what is my most popular tweet for the past 24 hours. And it's popping up one that shows uh, using Cosmos DB to flow documents from Office 365 through Event Grid and so on and so forth. So that's an example of, of what I can do to monitor the information. And just because it's non-structured doesn't mean I can't execute queries over it. Now one of the things I showed you was two different ways of accessing the data. There's key value for table, and then there was document for SQL. The way Cosmos DB does this is there's an internal way that it stores data called ARS, atom record sequence. And a record is just a set of atoms or primitives like a string, a numeric, et cetera. And then a sequence can be multiple records or it can be multiple atoms. It's recursive, basically. This is projected onto the API. So I have a logical item called a container, which is where related documents or entities will exist. And then based on my API, that might get projected to a collection, a table, or a graph. In a similar way, the individual items within that will be brought to me as a document, as a key value pair, or in the case of graph, as a node or a vertice, vertex. Vertice? Vertex. So that's how it handles that piece. So before I jump into the other APIs, I just want to take a minute and talk about why we even like running on distributing this data through the managed database. In addition to what I talked to you before, there's four nines availability that may have actually been increased. I think they announced that Ignite, it may be five nines, so I'll have to look into that. Guaranteed throughput, I'm gonna talk about that more in a second. And that consistency level that I talked to you about, you're guaranteed to have that behavior. So in other words, if you configure strong consistency, you're guaranteed not to have eventual consistency, which would really mess up your applications, right, if that happened. Talking about request units or throughput, and don't worry, all these links will be available. You can drive into them. The way Cosmos DB is effective is that you say, I need this much performance, and then Cosmos DB provisions what's necessary to accommodate that request. So it's not the model for serverless where as more requests come in, it's auto-scaling. You're saying, I'm expecting a big hit, so I want to provision this. So it uses something called a request unit. Request unit is just a standard unit of CPU storage and memory needed to complete an operation. You can manage just getting a single item. It's probably not too many request units. A complicated query could be several. Now the good news is that link that I map to gives you some guidance on configuring your request units. You can upload some documents and estimate that. But Cosmos DB will always tell you what throughput was actually needed and how you can tweak this to set and accommodate the throughput. So having said that, I want to go to the MongoDB API. And what I did was I used the USDA database. This is a, a public database you can download from the USDA site. It has about 12 relational tables. What I did was map them into three collections. It could have been one collection with just a type on the collection. But to make the demo easy, I wanted to be able to quickly list groups, quickly list nutrients, which are things like protein, carbs, fat, calories. And then I have one table that aggregates all those other tables into a food item. So I have a food item, what group does it belong to, what's the nutrition information. Now what's interesting about this is different food items have different amounts of nutrient data. So we might model this in our code as an array of items because I may have three, I may have 10. So that's what it would look like as, as JSON, as an array. To take advantage of indexing though, I can't index on an array. I have to index on a property, but because I'm not locked into a schema, 
I can easily have one item that has a protein and carb property and the next document can just have protein. And then I can take advantage of that automatic indexing. So to see that in action, I'm going to pop into the USDA database, and these are called collections as well, with food groups, nutrient definitions, food items. I'm going to jump into food items here, and we'll go ahead and open full screen so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. In my cursor, I'm telling you, it works. So this is pulling up some default items, and you'll notice that I have two keys here. I have an ID, and then I have this food group ID. This is a partition key. So I'm partitioning over the food group. So I'm saying logically food items in the same group belong together. That doesn't constrain me in the sense of what I can do, but it provides some optimizations, and I want to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to write a MongoDB query, which is probably going to look pretty strange. If you're not familiar with it, let's open this up and zoom in. So my MongoDB query, I'm going to say the property description is going to be a regular expression, and we're going to search for the word scrambled inside of it. And just checking my syntax, I'm going to execute that. And it's going to go off, and basically it has to scan through everything, right? There's no index on a regular expression, so it has to look at a lot of columns. I get three values back. And if I look at my stats, it took 5,264 request units, because it's going across everything to get that back. So now I'm going to make just a slight change. I'm going to look at this first item, and I can see it's in a group called Dairy and Egg Products group 0100. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to change my query a little bit. And I'm going to change this to say and. I'm going to turn this into an object. So this is just an array. If I execute this query, it should come back sort of the exact same. And I'm using up all my request units. But now I'm going to add another condition. And that other condition, I'm going to say group dot description. And I'm just going to give it that direct value, dairy and egg products. So this can take advantage of the index now, looking straight at the index for that food group ID. And when I execute it, you can see I get two results. It was in a different food group. But now my stats are down to 228 request units. So I've saved a lot by using that index. But to prove that partitions even help us further, I'm going to change this one more time to what my partition key is. The way I logically group the data, I'm going to call this food group ID. I'm going to give it 0, 100. When I execute this, it comes back. I still get two results. You can see the request units have reduced even more because it's now what's called a single partition query. Cosmos DB knew, because I used the partition key, that it could look at a subset of the data and it could optimize for that. So when I come back to my database setup, I can go into the overview, and actually come down here to metrics, and it will give me information about how that partitioning is working. So if I go into storage, close this out, and I pick my USDA database, I pick my food items. We can see over here, this is how the data is distributed across my food groups. You can see there's some outliers, there's some low liars, but for the most part, it's evenly distributed, which is guidance. You want to try to have these evenly distributed. Down here, it's taken those logical groupings and created five physical partitions that it's showing me. And this is just it behind the scenes deciding that your data access is going to work best if I group the data and replicate it like this. I can drill into a single one and see this. But my point is that I can get to all this information it's being done completely automatically for me. And to get at that in code, I decided to use Visual Studio Code. Any Visual Studio Code developers in here using that? About half, half the audience. So I could just as easily develop on Cosmos DB with this ID as well. What I'm showing you here, don't worry about the details, it's, just, it's using a MongoDB client. MongoDB is being tricked. It has no clue it's talking to Cosmos DB, the driver. Is, is being tricked. So I'm just using the client the SDK for this. 
My model for a class looks like something I would be familiar with. It's a plain old C-sharp object with properties. Here's a test program I use to make sure that when you're running it yourself and you import the database, you can run this test program to make sure it successfully. And here we're getting all the food groups. So we're telling it what to project this onto, and you can project it onto the equivalent of a JSON object if the schema changes between items. And then we do it as queryable to list. The other thing I'm doing down here is I'm grabbing the very first food item. And again, this is a link syntax I should be familiar with, first or default, async. So to take that a step further, I've got a controller where I'm standing up a web API so that I can interact with this from a client application. To get a food group, I pass in a code. And again, this should be very familiar. I have this request that filters on that code. And then I'm grabbing all the food items that also map that code and I'm bringing it back. This is used to power a front end app that I put together to explore this USDA example. So what I can do, for example, is the query I just showed you. Go into that food group, I'm entering scrambled, I click search, API pulls back two items and I get all the nutrient information about that. To give you an idea of how the indexes work, I happen to follow a 100% plant-based diet. And so I know that nut and seed products are high in calcium. I may want to figure out what can I eat the least of to get the most calcium. So what I'm doing is picking the nuts and seeds. I'm going in here to calcium. And when I click get top foods, it's going to give me the top 100 foods sorted by calcium by weight descending. So the first one will have the most calcium by weight. So I'm going to click that. And in case you missed it, I'm just going to click it again. Because this is how fast it did that query. And I can go ahead and change it to fructose because I want to get as much sugar as I can out of every bite. And we can see that hemp seeds are actually high in fructose. Who knew? So that's an example of an application that's running. And again, this is all in source control, so you can check it out and, and work with it yourself. That was the MongoDB API. Next API I want to explore is the graph API, and that's using a flights database. So there's an open source database of airports and flight connections between it. So once again, if we go into the portal and see what I set up for that, we can see now, instead of collections, I have something called graphs. And this is, again, the collection of the container and the item specific to the API. I have a flights database. If I go into that database, it's going to ask me for a query, and it uses something called Gremlin syntax. And if there's no other reason to work with graph databases, it's, you get to work with cool things like Tinkerpop and Gremlin. I mean, how cool are those names, right, for the tools you work with? So Gremlin is a, a language designed specifically for querying graphs. In this case, I'm saying, give me a graph with this particular vertex. And so we'll say AVP, which happens to be the Wilk. Berry, Wilkes Burr, Wilkes Berry, Wilkes Burr. Okay, airport. See, I, I thought I was going to pronounce it correctly because I've been been told that it's it's not bar. And I do this, and this is pulling back a graph which is incredibly small, but you can see the connection. So you can explore this somewhat in the the portal. So I pull this down. Lots of connections, by the way, from this airport. In case you hadn't noticed. Now, what's interesting about this is I can look behind that query and see that at the end of the day, I'm still getting documents. And that's, oh, what a small sliver of document it is, but the, the details aren't important. I can extend this and say what I'm really interested in is just what's going outbound. Sometimes airports have different outbound and inbound, inbound flights. And then as I hover over these properties, It'll give me information over on the side panel, like airport latitude and longitude. So the edges have information about them, as well as the, the actual nodes. And then I can even further edit this query, pull this down, and I can say, just give me a count. And then it comes back and says there's six of these. In code, we can use that same Gremlin interface 
and write some code that basically has this complicated query, which again, it could be an entire talk of how to architect a Gremlin query. But this is basically saying, I want you to go out to this graph database. I'm gonna give you two nodes. And I want you to recursively walk through the connections between the nodes, find what's more direct path so we're not cycling and going back and forth. And then I have a constraint of distance for it. So this is gonna pull back a bunch of those paths basically between endpoints. And then it's going to filter them down to ones that are within a certain distance. And then it's gonna return them. And this application, again, it's in source code, you can check it out, works with Bing Maps to project flight paths. Take a look at that. So if we look at the flight paths, I've got my map up and primed. So I flew from Seattle into AVP, submit that. Now this is doing all the work on the server in this case. There are SDKs that you can use for Node, for Python, for pretty much any platform you want to interact with Cosmos DB. We're working on SDKs for that. But once it comes back through that, that query, you can see we plotted some paths. And this is the one I actually went through going out was through uh, Detroit. And when I go back, I'll actually come back out through Atlanta. So those are two of the paths. Something I used to do all the time before I moved to Seattle is actually fly from my original location, Atlanta, to Seattle. So I'm going to get those flight paths. And you can imagine there's probably one or two more ways, right, to, to travel that route. So there we go. But that pulled back, and you can see that there is a direct route, which is the one I take every time, and uh, get some good rest in or out. And that's highlighted in green. So the, the key here is that I'm not trying to make anyone an expert in, in graph or in document, but I want you to see what's possible and have applications with examples that you can work from for that. So that was the flights database. The other interface is Cassandra. And this one, I'm going to be working with some team members to build out good demos for that. This is the one I know the least about, and I didn't think it would be fair for me to just throw something randomly up to show you. Is anyone here working with Cassandra now, by the way? No one is, so no one's really missing anything. What I'm showing you here is that we're using, just like we did with Mongo, we're using the Cassandra driver to connect to Cosmos DB. And the idea is, again, I can take my existing applications, manage them through Cosmos DB, and use the interfaces that I'm familiar with. Now having said that, this is my favorite slide because this is where I get to talk for the next half hour of all the specific features. Actually, I specifically did not want this to be a bullet list. I just want to touch on them on a high level. These are all out of the box when I set up a Cosmos DB account. So again, I get back to if you've had to manage or set up those databases yourself, these are some things you get done for you and you can ask Microsoft to handle the pain points instead of you. And we get things like you know, there's recent support for multi-master write, which in a distributed database means that I can write locally instead of routing out to one master node, I can write to multiple nodes and still have performance and replication across those nodes. It was just announced at Ignite. I get automatic backups, I get automatic failover. I can even set my preferences. I can say that if this region fails, this is my next most important region. I get acid inside a partition, so I have that consistency behavior that I'm looking for. We have a change feed. This is huge, and if I, I dive deeper into Cosmos DB in, in future talks, I'll probably spend a lot more time on this with examples because the change feed constantly raises a notification as documents are being inserted or manipulated. So what you can do for that is, I showed you the example of the partition key and how it logically partitions. You may have one strategy that makes sense for one type of application, but you may need a completely different strategy to optimize for a different application that's looking at things in a different way. So you might want a different partition. Well, one database can only have one partition key, so a solution to that will be to use the change feed to be able to feed into another database that's partitioned differently. There's also examples of using, for example, Cosmos DB to store data, to build queries and dashboards on top of it, 
but there's still some legacy applications that need it in the relational database, so the change feed is used to drive updates into that relational database. Very powerful feature. Cosmos DB encrypts everything, both in transit and at rest. Cannot connect to Cosmos DB over an unsecure connection, so it takes care of that for you. It takes advantage of something called geofencing, which means I may have rules that dictate where my data can be stored. So if I have the data in a certain country, it can't leave that country, and Cosmos DB has a rules engine that's built in to, to manage that. It supports geospatial data. It supports Link. Anyone here familiar with Link, out of curiosity? Yeah, uh, some, some people laugh, like, who doesn't know Link? But some people might not have gotten to use it. It's a, a very powerful tool, and it, part of, I think, the um, interesting thing about the different drivers is how they take the Link queries and map them to the underlying querying syntax, because you saw that I had to use JSON objects to query MongoDB, but when I pull in the .NET SDK, I can just use Link syntax and get the same on my end of the bargain. There's a local emulator, which is great for local development cycles and testing. You're not paying dollars or burning cycles in Azure to develop locally. It's also great for DevOps. Continuous integration and continuous deployment, you can set that up on your server and run those high fidelity tests for that. ODBC support, recycle bin. I mean, that one I kind of gloss over a little bit because I know no one's ever accidentally deleted data, database that they didn't want to. So we'll move on to security. There's a ton of security certificates and compliance. I showed you just a little taste of the serverless, how we have the bindings that come out of the box that let me very easily declare, I'm interested in, in this connection or I'm interested in this record. If you remember, when I was storing statistics for my link shortener, all I did was built up a dynamic object, and it could have been a strongly typed object as well but I like to have conditional properties. If something's not on the data, why set it to null? Just don't set the property. And just returning from the function in serverless will insert that record in the database for me, which is pretty powerful. And then the other thing that, for the sake of time, I didn't dive into, but you should know there's support for, is store procedures, triggers, and user-defined view. So you have all that functionality and support in your database. The other question I get quite a bit is what about the money and the cost? So what I wanna focus on here is very specifically the developer experience. If you have one of the free 12 month Azure subscriptions, Cosmos DB is included in that. There's also an option to get started without giving up a credit card so you can kick the tires. That's the second link. You can use the local emulator, but then we had a lot of Interesting updates come out of Ignite as well that you can see through the blog posts and feeds. I've got links to the documentation. There are case studies you can look at to see total cost of ownership. If you can imagine what it takes to set up geo-replication yourself, and then obviously there would be side-by-side -side comparisons to other hosting providers of managed databases. But we also have this concept called database level provisioning. Has anyone run into this? out of curiosity, looking at request units at all? Or is everyone pretty much new to Cosmos DB? Because the, these two announcements, database level provisioning and reserve capacity, some of the, the biggest pieces of feedback I've gotten when I've talked about it in the past is the way that we used to set up how you scale your databases is you would configure a throughput per collection. I might have a collection of these items, so on USDA database, I had three collections. So each one can get different provision throughput. But that means that if I have a lot of collections, it makes it somewhat more expensive than maybe another solution that I just provision throughput globally. Because I have to do set a tier for each collection. So database level lets you set it at a database level and say, I'm not gonna be penalized for having more or less collections. I can set it across the board. The other thing is reserve capacity. I can make a commitment that I need this much capacity over time and like a, a bulk discount, right? So I can get significant discounts on that by reserving the capacity ahead of time and saying I'm gonna provision this much for a certain time period out and realize a discount for that. So to conclude for this, hopefully if you're not familiar with NoSQL, you have an idea of, of what it is, what some of the use cases are what it's useful for, and 
Azure Cosmos DB is going to address all of those major scenarios, if that's what you're working with. You get the scale, the speed, the security. It's all turnkey. And uh, <laughs> I say all serverless. In my serverless talk, I sort of made the, um, the clarification that I believe serverless is about micro-billing. So technically, we'll call it fully managed, but it integrates well with serverless platforms. And then you have your data piece, whether it's Azure SQL, Azure Cosmos DB, as the fully managed piece of that. I say .NET ready because I know there's a lot of, who's a .NET developer, by the way? Okay, so there's a lot of hands in the audience. And I wanted you to know that you know, we have this support for that, but for developers who are here or who are listening on the stream who work with other technologies, Node.js is huge. We have full support for Node.js, ready for multiple platforms. These are the links to the repositories to try it out for free and to drill into some of the documentation I talked about. And I meant what I said earlier. We want this documentation to be phenomenal for you. So if you have feedback, there's several things you can do. First off, our documentation is a large open source project that uses Markdown. Some people don't realize that and know that they can submit pull requests to fix documentation that you find. That's one way. You can also raise issues and say, I need this scenario, or this is incorrect, or this is out of date. And we want to keep it as current and practical as possible. Now, having said that, this was definitely, I did not call it a gentle introduction to NoSQL for a reason. You know, there were a lot of demos and a lot of different paradigms. What questions are, are top of mind? Yes. Right, no, it needs to scale, so you can, and you can do things like, for example, you can connect a change feed to Event Hub, and then Event Hub gives you the streaming pulls and time series and everything else. So the question was, is the chain feed something that you just have to respond as it comes through, or can you replay or, or look at previous changes? And it'll connect directly with other resources that are designed specifically to do that. Other questions? Yes. Is there an API to bind the couch? There is not. Other questions? Yes. Any plans to support Safer, another API, right, as opposed to Gremlin? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't believe so, but I don't know. But if you get in touch with me offline, I can connect us with you. Other questions? Fantastic, so I covered all the points, and everyone here is an expert at consistency levels now? Yep, and are we still rowdy, excited about the, the last session that we're going into? Yeah, maybe, a little bit? All right, thanks, I, I kind of cheated there because now I'm gonna say thank you so much for coming out, and I'm going to be hanging out. I actually don't fly out till tomorrow, so if you see me around, stop by, say hi, ask questions, happy to follow up, and thank you for spending time with me.